Hey guys, welcome to my side of the mountain. This is our second to last uh, section. It's a little long because we only have this week and next week to get into it. We're covering 28 pages. I'll try to read as fast as I can. Uh, we'll try to limit the time of this video, so uh, stick with me here. Uh, follow along if you can. So page 120. Uh, if you remember, Bando has come to visit Sam in the mountain unexpectedly on Christmas. Okay, and that's where we left off. Uh, Sam and Bando had just met up on uh, Christmas Eve, I believe. You've been living well, he said. He looked closely at my face. But you're going to need a shave in a year or two. I thanked him and we sprang up the mountain, cut across to the gorge and home. How's the frightful? He asked as soon as we were inside and the light was lit. I whistled. She jumped to my fist. He got bold and stroked her. In the jam, he asked. Excellent, except the crocs are absor absorbent and are sopping up all the juice. Well, I bought you some more sugar. We'll try next year. Merry Christmas, Thoreau, he shouted and looked about the room. I see you've been busy. A blanket, new clothes, and an ingenious fireplace with a real chimney. And say, you have silverware. Picked up the forks I had carved. We ate smoked fish for dinner with boiled dog tooth violet bulbs. Walnuts dipped in jam or dessert. Bando was pleased with the jam. When we were done, Bando stretched out on my bed. He propped his feet up and lit his pipe. And now I have something to show you, he said. He reached in his coat pocket and took out a newspaper clipping. It was from a New York paper, and it read, Wild boys suspected living off deer and nuts in the wilderness of cat skills. I looked at Bando and leaned over to read the headline myself. Have you been talking, I asked. Me, don't be ridiculous. You have had several visitors other than me. The fire warden, the old lady, I cried out. Now Thoreau, this could only be a rumor. Just because it is in print doesn't mean it's true. Before you get excited, sit still and listen, he read. Resident of Delhi in the Catskill Mountains report that a wild boy who lives off deer and nuts is hiding out in the mountains. Several hunters stated that this boy stole deer from them during hunting season. I did not, I shouted. I only took the ones they had wounded and couldn't find. Well, that's what they told their wives when they came home without their deer. Anyways, listen to this. This wild boy has been seen from time to time by Catskill residents, some of whom believe he is crazy. Well, that's a terrible thing to say. Just awful, he stated. Any normal red-blooded American boy wants to live in a treehouse and trap his own food. They just don't do it, that's all. Read on, I said. Officials say that there's no evidence of any boy living alone in the mountains and add that all abandoned houses and sheds are routinely checked for just such events. Nevertheless, the residents are sure that such a boy exists in story. That's a lot of nonsense. I leaned back against the bedstead and smiled. Ho, ho, ho. Don't think that ends it. Bando said and reached in his pocket for another clipping. This one is dated December 5th and the other was November 23rd. Shall I read? Yes. Old Roman reports meeting wild boy while picking strawberries in Catskills. Miss Thomas Fielder, 97, resident of Delhi, New York, told the, the, this reporter that she met a wild boy on Bitter Mountain last June while gathering her annual strawberry jelly supply. She said the boy was brown haired, dusty, and wandering aimlessly around the mountains. However, she added he seemed to be in good flesh and happy. The old woman, a resident of the mountain resort town for 97 years, called this office to report her observation. Local residents report that Miss Fielder is a fine old member of the community who occasionally sees imaginary things. Bando roared. I must say I was sweating, for I really did not expect this event. And now, when on Bando, and now the Queen, the New York Papers. This story was buried on page 19. No sensationalism for this paper. Boy reported living off land in Catskills. A young boy of 17 or 18 who left home with a group of Boy Scouts is reported to be still be scouting in that area, according to the fire warden of the Catskill Mountains. Evidence of someone living in the forest, a fireplace, soup bones, and cracked nuts was reported by Warden Jim Handy, who spent the night in the wilderness looking for the lad. 
Jim stated the young man had apparently left the area and there was no evidence of his camp upon a second trip. What second trip, I asked. Vando puffed his pipe, looked at me wistfully and said, are you ready to listen? Sure, I answered. Well, here's the rest of it. There was no trace of his camp on a second trip and the warden believes that this young man returned to his home at the end of the summer. You know, Thoreau, I could scarcely drag myself away from the newspapers to come up here. You make a marvelous story. I said, put more wood on the fire. It is Christmas. No one will be searching these mountains until May Day. Bando asked for the willow whistles. I got them for him, and after running the scale several times, he said, let us serenade the ingenuity of the American newspaper man. Then let us serenade the conservationists who have protected the American wilderness so that a boy can still be alone in the world of millions of people. Uh, this is the whistle they're talking about made uh, from a willow. So you get this branch, uh, you, you cut right here, and then you put a notch here, and these willows are uh, kind of hollow. And then you uh, tap off this bark. You see the bark comes off. And then you uh, cut this part off with a knife. And then you slide that back on. It kind of becomes like a slide whistle. I thought that was suitable, and we played Holy Night. We tried the 12 days of Christmas, but the whistles were too stiff and Bando too tired. Thoreau, my body needs rest. Let's give up, he said. Too bad starts. I banked the fire and blew out the candle and slept in my clothes. It was Christmas when we awoke. Breakfast was light acorn pancakes, jam, and sassafras tea. Bando went for a walk. I lit the fire in the fireplace and spent the morning creating a feast from the wilderness. I gave Bando his presents when he returned. He liked them. He was really pleased. I could tell by his eyebrows. They went up and down, in and out. Furthermore, I know he liked the presents because he wore them. The onion soup was about to be served when I heard a voice shouting in the distance. I know you are there. I know you are there. Where are you? Dad? I screamed and dove right through the door, onto my stomach. I all but fell down the mountain shouting, Dad, Dad, where are you? I found him resting in a snowdrift, looking at the cardinal pear that lived near the stream. He was smiling, stretched out on his back, not in exhaustion, but in joy. Merry Christmas, he whooped. I ran towards him. He jumped to his feet, tackled me, thumped my chest, and rubbed snow in my face. Then he stood up, lifted me from the snow by the pockets of my coat, and held me off the ground so that we were eye to eye. He sure smiled. He threw me down in the snow again and wrestled with me for a few minutes. Our formal greeting done, we strode up the mountain. Well, son, he began, I've been reading about you in the newspaper, and I can no longer resist the temptation to visit you. I still can't believe you did it. His arm went around me. He looked real good, and I was overjoyed to see him. How did you find me, I asked eagerly. I went to Miss Fielder, and she told me which mountain. At the stream, I found your raft and ice fishing holes. Then I looked for trails and footsteps. When I thought it was getting warm, I hollered. Am I that easy to find? You didn't have to answer, and I'd probably have frozen in the snow. He was pleased and not angry at all at me, at all, he said again. I just didn't think you'd do it. I was sure you'd be back the next day. When you weren't, I bet, on the next week, then the next month. How's it going? Oh, it's wonderful life, Dad. When we walked into the tree, Bando was putting the final touches on the venison steak. Dad, this is my friend, Professor Bando. He's a teacher. He got lost one day last summer and stumbled onto my camp. He liked it so well that he came back for Christmas. Bando, meet my father. Bando turned the steak on the spit, rose and shook my father's hand. I'm pleased to meet the man who sired this boy, he said grandly. I could see that they liked each other and that it was gonna be a splendid Christmas. Dad stretched out on the bed and looked around. I thought maybe you'd pick a cave, he said. The papers reported that they were looking for you in old sheds and houses, but I knew better than that. However, I never would have thought of the inside of a tree. What a beauty. Very clever, son. Very, very clever. This is a comfortable bed. 
He noticed my food caches stood and peered into them. Not enough to last until spring? I think so, I said. If I don't keep getting hungry visitors all the time, I winked at him. Well, I would wear out my welcome by a year if I could, but I have to get back to work soon after Christmas. How's mom and all the rest, I asked. I took down the turtle shell plates and set them on the floor. She's marvelous how she manages to feed and clothe those eight youngsters. On what I bring her, I don't know, but she does it. She sends her love and says that she hopes you are eating well-balanced meals. The onion soup was simmering and ready. I gave dad his. First course, I said. He breathed deeply of the odor and downed it, boiling hot. Son, this is better onion soup than the chef at the Waldorf can make. And uh, I looked this up just so you guys don't know. The Waldorf is like a fancy uh, restaurant uh, slash hotel in New York City. And uh, apparently there are in other cities too, as I was finding this picture, but it's a uh, really fancy restaurant. Vando sipped his, and I put mine in the snow to cool. Your mother will stop worrying about your diet when she hears of this. Vando rinsed Dad's soup bowl in the snow, and with great ceremony and elegance, he could really be elegant when he had the occasion rose, poured him a turtle shell of sassafras tea. Quoting a passage from one of Dickens' food-eating scenes, he carved the blackened steak. It was pink and juicy inside. Cooked to perfection, we were all proud of it. Dad had to finish his tea before he could eat. I short on bowls. Then I filled a shell. A mound of sort of fluffy mashed cattail tubers, mushrooms, and dog tooth violet bulbs, smothered in gravy, thickened with acorn powder. Each plate had a pile of soaked and stewed honey locust beans mixed with hickory nuts. The beans are so hard it took three days to soak them. It was a glorious feast. Everyone was impressed, including me. When we were done, Bando went down to this stream and cut some old dried and hollowed reeds. He came back and carefully made us each a flute with the tip of his penknife. He said the willow whistles were too old for such an occasion. We all played Christmas carols until dark. Bando wanted to try something complicated, jazz tunes, but the late hour, the small fire dancing and throwing heat and the snow insulating us from the winds made us all so sleepy that we were not capable of more than a last slow rendition of caps before we put ourselves on and under skins and blew out the light. Before anyone was awake the next morning, I heard Frightful call hungrily. I'd put her outside to sleep as we were very crowded. I went out to find her. The Christmas dinner had been a big piece of venison, but the night air had enlarged her appetite. I called her to my fist and went in the meadow to wrestle up breakfast for our guests. She wasn't about to go after a rabbit, but I thought that wasn't proper fare for a post-Christmas breakfast. So we went to the stream. Frightful caught herself a pheasant while well, I kicked a hole in the ice and did a little ice fishing. I caught about six trout and whistled Frightful to my hand. We returned to the hemlock. Dad and Bando were still asleep with their feet in each other's faces, but both looking very content. I built the fire and was cooking the fish and making pancakes when Dad shot out of bed. Wild boy, he shouted. What a sanguine smell. What a purposeful fire. Breakfast in a tree. Sun, I toil from sunup to sundown and never have I lived so well. I served him. He choked a bit on the acorn pancakes. They are a little flat and hard, but Bando got out some of his blueberry jam and smothered the pancakes with an enormous portion. Dad went through the motion of eating this. The fish, however, he enjoyed it and he asked for more. We drank sassafras tea, sweetened with some of the sugar Bando had brought me, rubbed our turtle shells clean in the snow, and went out into the forest. Dad had not met Frightful. When she winged down from out of the hemlock, he ducked and flattened in the snow, shouting, Blast off! He was very cool towards Frightful until he learned that she was the best provider he had ever had in our family. And then he continually praised her beauty and admired her talents. He even tried to pet her, but Frightful was not to be won. She snagged him with her talons. They stayed away from each other for the rest of Dad's visit although dad never ceased to admire her from a safe distance. Bando had to leave two or three days after Christmas. He had some papers to grade and he started off reluctantly one morning, looking very unhappy about the way of life he had chosen. He shook hands all around and then turned to me and said, I'll save all the newspaper clippings for you. And if the reporters start getting 
too hot on your trail, I'll call the New York paper and give them a bum steer. I could see he rather liked the idea and departed a little happier. Dad lingered on for a few more days, ice fishing, setting my traps and snares, and husking walnuts. He whittled some cooking spoons and forks. On New Year's Day, he announced that he must go. I told your mother I'd only stay for Christmas. It's a good thing she knows me or she might be worried. She won't send the police out to look for you, I asked hurriedly. Could she think you never found me? Oh, I told her I'd call her Christmas night if I didn't. He poked around for another hour or two, trying to decide just how to leave. Finally, he started down the mountain. He had hardly gone a hundred feet before he was back. I've decided to leave by another route. Somebody might backtrack me and find you, and that would be too bad. He came over to me, put his hand on my shoulder. You've done very well, Sam, he grinned and walked off towards the gorge. I watched him bound from rock to rock. He waved from the top of the large rock and leaped into the air. That was the last I saw of Dad for a long time. In which I have a good look at winter, find spring in the snow. With Christmas over, the winter became serious. The snows deepened, the wind blew, the temperature dropped until the air snapped and talked. Never had humanity seen so far away as it did in those cold, still months of January, February, and March. I wondered the snowy crags, listening to the language of the birds by day and to the noise of the weather by night. The wind howled, the snow avalanche, and the air creaked. I slept, ate, played my reed whistle, and talked to frightful. To be relaxed, warm, and part of the winter wilderness in an unforgettable experience. I was in excellent condition. Not a cold, not a sniffle, not a moment of fatigue. I enjoyed the feeling that I could eat, sleep, and be warm, and out with the storms that blasted the mountains, and the sub-zero temperatures that numbed them. It snowed on. I plowed through drifts and stamped paths until eventually it occurred to me that I had all the material to make snowshoes for easily traveling. Here are the snowshoes notes. And uh, here's some instructions on uh, making snowshoes if you guys are interested. Uh, so basically you kind of get, just get two sticks. You make a part here in the middle to snap your uh, feet into, and then you can use rope, or he probably used uh, like leather straps to uh, weave it around. And uh, here's an even easier one. This is just out of branches down here. I made slats of ash saplings, whittling them thin enough to bow. I soaked them in water to make them bend more easily, looped the two ends together, and wound them with hide. With my pen knife, I made holes an inch apart all around the loop. I strung deer hide crisscrossing through the loops. I made a loop of hide to hold my toe and straps to tie the shoes on. When I first walked in these shoes, I tripped on my toes and fell, but by the end of the first day, I could walk from the tree to the gorge in half the time. I live close to the weather. It is surprising how you watch it when you live in it. Not a cloud passed unnoticed. Not a wind blew untested. I knew the moods of the storms, where they came from, their shapes and colors when the sun shone. I took Frightful to the meadow, and we slid down the mountain on the snapping turtle shell sled. She really didn't care much for this. When the wind changed and the air smelled like snow, I'd stay in my tree because I'd gotten lost in a blizzard one afternoon and had to hole up in a rock ledge until I could see where I was going. That day, the winds were so strong I could not push against them. So I crawled under the ledge. For hours, I wondered if I would be able to dig out when the storm blew on. Fortunately, I only had to push through about a foot of snow. However, that taught me to stay home when the air said snow. Now that I was afraid of being caught far from home in a storm, or I could find food and shelter and make a fire anywhere, but I had become as attached to my hemlock house as a brooding bird to her nest. Caught out in the storm and weather, I had an urgent desire to return to my tree, even as a barrow, barren weasel returned to his den and the deer to their copes. We had our little pats in the wilderness. We all fought to return there. And copes is a weird word, so a deer copes, is uh, like when you are hiking in the forest, deers will make these beds. They'll like push, press down the vegetation, either the um, grass or the, the, the bushes. And it, you can really tell that something uh, has been sleeping there. It kind of looks almost like a, a mattress. I usually came home at night with my nut hatch that roosted in a nearby sapling. And remember the nut hatch is that little bird. 
I knew it was late if I tapped the tree and he came out. Sometimes when the weather was icy and miserable, I'd hear him high in his tree near the edge of the meadow, yanking and yanking and flicking his tail. And when I would see him wing to bed early, I considered him a pretty good borrow meter. And if we went to his tree early, I went to mine early too. When you don't have a newspaper or radio to give you weather bulletins, watch the birds and animals. They can tell when a storm is coming. Called the nut hatch borrow meter. And when he hold up, I hold up, lit my light, and sat by my fire, whittling or le learning new tunes on my reed whistle. I was now really into the teeth of winter and quite fascinated by its activity. There's no such thing as a still winter night. Not only are many animals running around in the creaking cold, but the trees cry out and limbs snap and fall to the ground, gets caught in a ravine and screams until it dies. One noisy night, I put this down. This is a barometer. Uh, it's a thing that detects the uh, weather, the high and low pressure. And uh, if it's a high pressure, uh, I looked up what it did too. If it's high pressure, you can expect clear skies and cool temperatures. If it's low pressure, you can expect the other thing. So this is a barometer. Uh, he was using the behavior of the birds to kind of do the same thing as uh, this device. There's somebody in my bedroom. I can hear small exchanges of greetings and a little feet moving up the wall. By the time I get to my light, all is quiet. Next day, there's something in my room last night. A small tunnel leads out from my door into the snow. It is a marvelous tunnel, neatly packed, and it goes from a dried fern to a clump of moss, then it turns and disappears. I would say mouse. That night, kept an ember glowing and got a light fast before the visitor could get to the door. It was a mouse. Perfect little white-footed deer mouse with enormous black eyes and tidy white feet. Caught in the act of intruding, decided not to retreat, but came towards me a few steps. I handed him a, a nut meat. He took it in his fragile paws, stuffed it in his cheeks, flipped and went out his secret tunnel. No doubt the tunnel leads right over to my store tree, and this fellow is having a fat winter. And uh, this is that white-footed deer mouse. They have really big eyes, and they have white feet. That's why they're called that. They actually carry a lot of diseases, too. So uh, if you're ever out in the wild, be really uh, cautious. If you see a lot of mice, try to kind of stay away from them, because they'll give you Lyme disease or uh, different types of diseases. There were no raccoons or skunks about in the snow, but the mice, the weasels, the minks, the foxes, the shrews, the cottontail rabbits were all busier than Coney Island in July. Their tracks were all over the mountains and their activities ranged from catching each other to hauling various materials back to their dens and burrows for more insulation. Day by day, the birds were a wing. They got up late after I did and would call to each other before hunting. I could stir up my fire and think about how much food it would take to keep one little bird alive in that fierce cold. It must eat and eat and eat, I thought. Once, however, I came upon a male cardinal sitting in a hawthorn bush. It was a miserable day, gray, damp, and somewhere around the zero mark. The cardinal wasn't doing anything at all, just sitting on a twig, all fluffed up to keep himself warm. Now there's a wise bird, I said to myself. He's conserving his energy, none of this flying around looking for food and wasting effort. As I watched him, he shifted his feet twice, standing on one and pulling the other up into his warm feathers. I had often wondered why birds didn't freeze and feet didn't freeze, and there was my answer. He even sat down on both of them and let his warm feathers cover them like socks. So this is a cardinal. I just always think these are really pretty birds. Uh, with the red and the black. January 8th, I took Frightful out today. We went over to the meadow to catch a rabbit for her. As we passed one of the hemlocks near the edge of the grove, she pulled her feathers to her body and looked alarmed. I tried to find out what had frightened her, but saw nothing. On the way back, we passed the same tree and I noticed the owl pellet cast in the snow. I looked up, there are lots of limbs in darkness, but I could not see the yowl. I walked around the tree, Frightful stared at one spot until I thought her head would swivel off. I looked, and there it was, looking like a broken limb, a great horned owl. I must say I was excited to have such a neighbor. I hit the tree with a stick, and he flew off. Those great wings, they must have been five feet across, beat the wind, 
there's no sound. The owl stared, steered down the mountain through the tree limbs, and somewhere not far away, he vanished in the needles and limbs. It is really very special to have a horned owl. I guess I feel this way because he is such a wilderness bird. He needs lots of forest and big trees, and so his presence means that the Gribbly Farm is in a beautiful place indeed. Great horned owls have these horns on their head. If you see an owl with these horns, they are a great horned owl. They are, uh, like he said, they only live deep, deep in the woods, so they're pretty rare to see a great horned owl. They're really big. They're probably uh, stand three feet high, and they have about five feet wingspan. One week in weather gave a little to the sun, and snow melted, and limbs dumped their loads and popped into the air. I thought I'd try to make an igloo. I was cutting big blocks of snow and putting them in a circle. Rifle was dozing with her face in the sun and the tree sparrows were raiding the hemlock cones. I worked and hummed and did not notice the gray sheet of cloud that was sneaking up the mountain from the northwest to cover the sun suddenly. I realized the air was damp enough to ring. It could stay as warm as a bug if I didn't get wet. So I looked at the drab mass in the sky, whistled for frightful and started back to the tree. We hold up just as the just as Barometer was yanking his way home, it was none too soon. It drizzled, it misted, it sprinkled, and finally it froze. The deer hide door grew stiff with ice as darkness came, and it rattled like a piece of tin when the wind hit it. I made a fire, the tree room warmed, and I puttered around with a concoction I call possum soup. A meal of frozen possum stewed with lichens, snake weeds, and louse wort. It is a different sort of dish, of course. What I really like about it are the names of all the plants and the name possum. I fooled for an hour or so brewing this dish, adding this and that when I heard the mouse in his tunnel. I realized he was making an awful fuss and decided it was because he was trying to gnaw through ice to get in. I decided to help him. Rifle was on her post and I wanted to see the mouse's face when he found that he was in a den with a falcon. I pushed the deerskin door, it wouldn't budge. I kicked it, it gave a little, cracking like china. And I realized that it was going to be iced in if I didn't keep the door open. I finally got it open. There must have been an inch and a half of ice on it. The mouse, needless to say, was gone. I ate my supper and reminded myself to awaken and open the door off and on during the night. I put more wood on the fire as it was damp in spite of the flames and went to bed in my underwear and suit. I woke twice and kicked open the door when I fell into a sound sleep that lasted hours beyond my usual rising time. I overslept. I discovered because I was in a block of ice and none of the morning sounds of the forest penetrated my glass house to awaken me. The first thing I did was try to open the door. I chipped and kicked and managed to get my head out and see what had happened. I was sealed in. Now I have seen ice storms and I know they can be shiny and glassy and treacherous, but this was something else. There were sheets of ice binding the aspens to earth and cementing the tops of the hemlocks and arches. It was inches thick. Rifle winged out of the door and flew to a limb where she tried to perch. She slipped, dropped to the ground, and skidded on her wings and under covered to a low spot where she finally stopped. She tried to get to her feet, slipped, lost her bounds, and spread her wings. She finally flapped into the air and hovered there until she could locate a decent perch. She found one closest again to the bowl of the hemlock. It was ice free. So these ice storms come in and they get so icy that they just encase these trees in ice. And uh, they, they actually start to uh, snap the uh, ice. So all these were tree branches and stuff that got snowed in and I think down here was like a river or a lake or something but these these were all the the trees that are now covered in ice on this picture. I laughed at her and then I came out of the and took a step. I landed with an explosion on my seat. The jolt splintered the ice and sent glass covered limbs clattering to earth like a shot full of shattering crystal. As I sat there and I didn't dare to move because I might get hurt, I heard an enormous explosion. It was followed by splintering and clattering and smashing. A maple at the edge of the meadow had literally blown up. I feared now for my tree. The ice was too heavy to bear. 
While down, I chipped the deer flap clean and sort of swam back into my tree, listening to trees exploding all over the mountain. It was a fearful and dreadful sound. I lit a fire, ate smoked fish and dried apples and went out again. I must say I toyed with the idea of making ice skates. However, I saw the iron wagon axle iced against a tree and crawled to it. I de-iced it with the butt of my ax and used it for cane. I would stab it into the ground an inch long, tell a couple of times, but not as hard as the first time. Frightful saw me start off through the woods, where I had to see this winter display, and she winged to my shoulder, glad for a good perch. At the meadow, I looked hopefully for the sun, but I didn't have a chance. The sky was as thick as an Indian bean soup. Out in the open, I watched one tree after another splinter and break under the ice and the glass sparks that shot into the air. And the thunder that the ice made as it shattered were something to remember. At noon, not a drip had fallen. The ice was as tight as it had been at dawn. I heard no nut aches. The chickadees called once, but were silent again. There's an explosion near my spring. A hemlock had gone, frightful, and I crept back to the tree. I decided that if my house was gonna shatter, I'd just as soon be in it. Inside, I threw sticks to frightful and she caught them in her talons. This is a game we play when we are tense and bored. Night came and the ice still lay in sheets. We slept to the occasional boom of breaking trees, although the explosion were not as frequent. Apparently, the most rotted and oldest trees had collapsed first. The rest were more resilient, and unless a wind came up, I figured the damage was over. At midnight, a wind came up. It awakened me for the screech of the ice limbs rubbing each other, and the snapping of the ice were like the sounds of a madhouse. I listened, decided there was nothing I could do, buried my head under the deer skin, and went back to sleep. Around six or seven, I heard Barometer, the nuthatch. He yanked as he went food hunting through the hemlock grove. I jumped and looked out. The sun had come through, and the forest sparkled and shone in cruel splendor. That day, I heard the drip, drip begin, and by evening, some of the trees had dumped their loads and were slowly lifting themselves to their feet, so to speak. The aspens, the birch trees, however, were still bent like Indian bows. Three days later, the forest arose, the ice melted, and for about a day or two, had warm, glorious weather. The mountain was a mess. Broken trees, fallen limbs were everywhere. I felt badly about the ruins until I thought that this had been happening to the mountain for thousands of years, and that the trees were still there, as were the animals and birds. The birds were starved and many had died, found their cold little bodies under bushes and one stiff chickadee in a cavity. Its foot was drawn into its feathers. Its feathers were fluffed. Frightful ate old frozen muskrats during those days. We couldn't kick up a rabbit or even a mouse. They were in the snow under the ice, waiting it out. I suppose the mice went right on tunneling to the grasses and the mosses and had no trouble staying alive. But I did wonder how the barren weasel was doing. I needn't have. Here are some notes about him. I should not have worried about the barren weasel. He appeared after the ice storm, looking sleek and pleased with himself. I think he dined royally on the many dying animals and birds. And in the event, he was full of pep and ran up to the hemlock to chase Frightful off her perch. That barren. It's a good thing I don't have to tie Frightful much anymore, or he would certainly try to kill her. He still attacks me more for the fun of being since sprawling into the snow than for food, for he hasn't put his teeth in my trousers for months. January was a fierce month. After the ice storm came, more snow. The mountaintop was never free of it. The gorge was blocked. Only on the warmest days could I hear deep under the ice the trickle of water seeping over the falls. I still had food, but it was getting low. All the fresh frozen venison was gone and most of the bulbs and tubers. I longed for just a simple dandelion green. Towards the end of January, I began to feel tired and my elbows and knees were a little stiff. This worried me. I figured it was due to some vitamin I wasn't getting, but I couldn't remember which vitamin it was or even where I could find it if I couldn't remember it. One morning, my nose bled. It frightened me a bit and I wondered if I shouldn't hike to the library and read the material on vitamins. It didn't last long, however, so I figured it wasn't too serious. I decided I'd live until the greens came to the land for I was of the opinion that since I had nothing green for months, that was probably the trouble. On the same day, Frightful caught a rabbit in the meadow. As I cleaned it, the liver suddenly looked so tempting that I could hardly wait to prepare it. For the next week, I craved liver and ate all I could get. The tiredness ended, the bones stopped aching, and I had no more nosebleeds. 
hunger is a funny thing. It has a kind of intelligence all its own. I live almost every day until the first plants emerge, and I never had any more trouble. I've looked up vitamins since. I'm not surprised to find that the liver is rich in vitamin C. So are citrus fruits and green vegetables, the foods I lack. Wild plants like sorrel and dock are rich in the vitamin. Even if I had known this at the time, it would have done me no good, for they were but roots in the earth. As it turned out, liver was the only viable source of vitamin C. And on liver, I stopped without knowing why. So much for my health. I wonder now why I didn't have more trouble than I did, except that my mother worked in a children's hospital during the war, helping to prepare food, and she was conscious, conscious of what made up a balanced meal. We heard a lot about it as kids, so I was not unaware that my winter diet was off balance. After that experience, I noticed things in the forest that I hadn't paid any attention to before. A squirrel had stripped the bark off a sapling at the foot of my meadow, leaving it gleaming white. I pondered why when I saw it, wondering if he had a lack of vitamin or two and had sought them in the bark. I must admit, I tried a little of the bark myself, but decided that even if it was loaded with vitamins, I preferred liver. I also noted this, that the birds would sit in the sun when it favored our mountain with its light. And I began and I, being awfully vitamin-minded at the time, wondered if they were ga gathering vitamin D to be on the safe side. In view of this, I sat in the sun too when it was out. So did Prideful. My notes piled up during these months, and my journal of birch bark became a storing problem. I finally took it out of my tree and cached it under a rock ledge nearby. The mice made nests in it, but it held up even when it got wet. That's one thing about using the products of the forest. They are usually waterproof. This is important when the weather is as near to you as your skin and as much part of your life as eating. I was writing more about the animals now and less about myself, which proves I was feeling pretty safe. Here's an interesting entry. So uh, this isn't his journal, but this is birch bark. And uh, remember birch bark's that really white bark and it uh, even kind of has lines on it. So you can uh, cut it off in strips and then peel it and then you can almost write on it just like lined paper. February 6th. The deer have pressed in all around me. They are hungry. Apparently they stamp out yards in the valleys where they feed during the dawn and dusk. But many of them climb back to the hemlock grove to hide and sleep for the day. They manage the deep snow so effortlessly that on those slender hooves, if I had known that a million years from today, my children's children children were to live as I am living in these mountains, I would try to marry a wife with slender feet and begin immediately to breed a race with hooves that the cats filled children of the future might run through the snows and meadows and marshes as easily as the deer. I got to worrying about the deer. For many days, I climbed trees and cut down tender limbs for them. At first, only two came, then five, and soon I had a ring of large-eyed, white-tailed deer waiting on my tree at twilight for me to come down and chop off limbs. I was astonished to see this herd grow and wondered what signals they used to inform each other of my services. Did they smell fatter, look more content? Somehow they were able to tell their friends that there was a free lunch on my side of the mountain and more and more arrived. One evening, there were so many deer that they decided to chop limbs on the other side of the meadow. They were cutting up the snow and tearing up the ground around my tree with their pawing. Three nights later, they all disappeared. Not one deer came for limbs. I looked down the valley and in the dim light could see the open earth on the land below. The deer could forage again. Spring was coming to the land. My heart beat faster. I think I was trembling. The valley also blurred. The only thing that can do that is tears. So I guess I was crying. That night, the great horned owl boomed out across the land. My notes read, February 10th. I think the great horned owls have eggs. The mountain is white. The wind blows. The snow is hard packed. But spring is beginning in their hollow maples. I will climb it tomorrow, February 12th. Yes, 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 it is spring in the maple. Two great horned owl eggs lie in the cold snow-rimmed cavity in the broken top of the tree. They were warm to my touch. Eggs in the snow, now isn't that wonderful? I didn't stay long for it is bitter weather and I wanted the female to return immediately. Climbed down, and as I ran off towards my tree, I saw her drift on those muffed wings of the owl through the limbs and branches as she went back to her work. 
I crawled through the tunnel on my ice that leads to my tree now, the wind beating at my back. I spent the evening whittling and thinking about the owl high in the forest with the first new life of the spring. And so with the disappearance of the deer, the hoot of the owl, the cold land began to create new life. Spring is terribly exciting when you're living right in it. I was hungry for green vegetables that night as I went off to sleep. I thought about the pokeweeds, the dandelions, the spring beauties that soon be pressing up from the earth. And with that, we are finally done. Only one more section left, guys. Uh, sorry for the time. Good job making it through to the end if you did. And I will see you guys next time.